uh, Kubernetes. And remember, uh, we're doing this on Zoom, so everybody has the opportunity to talk. So just in case you have any question or comments, you can always unmute your microphone and ask me directly. So it doesn't need to be anything formal, it can be super informal because after all, we are at a uh, jug meeting and it's supposed to be super fun. And I believe that you can see my screen. Actually, I don't know if there is a way in Zoom to pin uh, my camera. So, oh yes, like this. So uh, you can see I'm using a virtual camera. So I believe that everybody can see my face, not the best part of the video, of course, and the slides too. Yeah, that's probably the best part. <laughs> yeah, the slides are better, much better. And uh, as everything that we do, uh, we, we do is open source. So I'm going to share on the chat uh, the link to the slides, today's slides. Let me just open here. And I'm going to send to everyone here. This is the, uh, the link to the slides that I'm using right now. And of course, uh, all the demos that I'm going to show you today, they are available and much more. They're available uh, on this link, dn.dev slash cube dash tutorial. So if you don't go to this particular link, you will be redirected to, let me click here. And I want uh, to type here, dn.dev slash cube dash tutorial. You'll be redirected to our Git repository. And before you ask, yes, if you find any issues or if you want to contribute uh, anything, we accept pull requests. And if you go to the right side of the screen, you have this link, Red Hat Scholars. If you click here, it will be redirected to the HTML version. And today we are covering the part uh, three. So just in case you missed the first part, uh, part number one tells you how can you, different ways for you to have access to a Kubernetes cluster. Today I'm using an OpenShift cluster which is running on AWS. I think previously I was using one that was running on Azure or IBM Cloud or something like that. So you have different options. You can run the stuff running on a mini cube locally on my, your machine, just in case you don't have like, or do, you, do, you don't want to spend like that money in the public cloud. And we started with this beginner introduction and today we are going to cover the elementary one. And you can see here that we have even more stuff. We have an intermediate and in advanced stuff. Uh, covering just Ingress for now because we have even more content. So uh, this, uh, we have three parts. Right now we have beginner, elementary and intermediate. And uh, uh, at least for this um, course of, uh, that we're doing right now, we're going to cover part one and part two. And if you're interested in more in Kubernetes, you can go and follow the instructions here by yourself. I hope it's documented well enough so you can follow by yourself. And if you have any questions, you can always ping me on Twitter uh, at Yanaga or my email, yanaga at redhat.com. I'll be more than happy to try to help you. Okay, so these are the links that I had to share with you. And moving forward. So yeah, I introduced myself last time, but my, again, my Twitter is at Yanaga. If you want to follow me, I still have an account on Twitter. So I talk a lot about Java, DevOps, microservices, cloud, cloud computing, and of course, Kubernetes and OpenShift the, these days. And I'm also a Japanese Brazilian, not the typical Brazilian you would expect, but yes, it's true. And what is the agenda that we're having today? So we're going to cover how to build images to be run inside a Kubernetes cluster, which are basically containers. Uh, how can you specify resource limits for the containers for your applications that are running in Kubernetes? Because you don't want an application to consume the entire memory or entire CPU of your host, uh, because you need to be a good citizen. You need to share the CPU and memory with other applications. How can you specify the amount of memory that you require? And how can you specify the limit the upper limit that the, your Kubernetes cluster can give to your particular application. So we are also going to see how to perform rolling updates, which is a, like a fancy way for you to perform uh, some uh, blue-green deployments. Also, how can we properly configure some liveness and redness probes? And how can we provide some properties, some configuration on the fly to your application inside Kubernetes? For example, sometimes we want, we, our application needs a database, but the database URL, username and password are different depending on the environment that you run. 
if you're in uh, development, if you're in testing, and if you're in production, you should have different URLs, different usernames and passwords. And very likely, you won't have the production password for your database. But still, your application needs to use these properties to connect to your, to, to your particular database in that environment. So how can you provide this uh, configuration that depends on the environment in which you're running? Well, for that, we can use environment variables and config maps, uh, for, uh, which is a, one of the many features that we have uh, using Kubernetes. Okay, so a quick recap of what we covered in the previous, uh, previous session. We have had this DevOps challenges for running multiple containers. How can I scale? If I have multiple applications using port 80, how can I avoid port conflicts? If one of the nodes goes down, what happens? and all of the stuff. Uh, we also learned some Kubernetes terms like pods, replica sets, and deployments. Uh, what is a Kubernetes service? Uh, persistent volume, so you can have a stateful application running on top of Kubernetes. Also, how can we organize our resources using labels? And how can we apply and filter the resources in which we want to apply our commands using these particular labels. So labels are a super nice way for you to organize your Kubernetes resources. And uh, let me sip some water here. Mm -hmm. hey, uh, in. If you have not already registered uh, for the raffle, please uh, do so. Um, I just pasted the link in the chat uh, for registering yourself for the raffle at the end of the event. We'll be linked to uh, JetBrains licenses. Sorry, it's awesome. Yeah, I hope you. Yeah, if you're watching this, I hope you win. Of course, we don't have one for everybody, but yeah, IntelliJ uh, products are super nice. Okay, and I'm sipping some water because I know it's 6 p.m. It's beer clock or wine o'clock, but at least for now, I'm still drinking water. Could be coffee too, just to get me even more excited to present this content. So, oh, I'm going back. So, so yeah. that was the recap. So let's move forward and see how can we build images to run on top of communities. And actually before that, let me show a quick demo because just talking and show slides is just boring. So right now you can see my terminal here and I already have an application deployed in my Kubernetes cluster. And let me see. Oh, my internet or my cluster is kind of slow today. Maybe it's AWS. Huh? I don't know if everybody's doing Bitcoin mining these days. So yes, I already have a, a pod running in my backend and I also have a service so we can access this particular one. And since they deployed quite some time ago, I can use this external IP to be accessing my endpoint. So if I curl this endpoint, we should be able to access this resource or uh, maybe not. Uh, so uh, as usual, the easiest way for me to expose any resources, uh, if you have a Kubernetes cluster in particular one, an OpenShift cluster is to create an OpenShift root, which is an OpenShift feature. So I just closed it before. So if I get this URL, yes, it's working. So you can see that's returning Aloha from, and every time I curl, I have a different number. So what we're going to do, I'm going to run a while true, do curl, and I'm going to sleep for like 300 milliseconds. And you can see, so yes, I'm curling and the number is increasing. So what we have right now is a Spring Boot application. So, and what happens when I deploy an application in Kubernetes and I ask Kubernetes to perform, to perform an upgrade of my application. So right now I'm running version one. So I'm going to upgrade my application to version two. So right now it's returning Aloha. I think version two should be returning a bonjour. It should be French. So how can we perform this upgrade? There are many different ways for us to be doing that, which we covered in the, in the last session. But one of my favorites is for to, uh, is about editing the deployment. So kubectl edit deploy and the name of the deploy is my boot. Okay. And if I just try to find the particular, uh, go through the YAML, you can see that I have this, uh, the container image is key.io, rh developers, my boot version one. So I'm going to change here to version two. I just changed it here. And as soon as I save the file, Kubernetes is going to perform this particular upgrade. So let's save this file. And you can see 
that my, my curve is still going on, the number is still increasing. And uh, since this is a Java application and Java sometimes takes some time to boot uh, and be able to reply to requests, we should, be, we should see some failures in this particular curve, okay? If I did it correctly. And uh, kubectl get pods. Let's see, oh yes, well, it's super slow. My Spring Boot application is uh, still starting up. And surprisingly, we didn't have any errors. Oh gosh, so just because I said that we would have errors, it didn't happen. So let's see <laughs> if I deployed the wrong one. And, uh, oh, it's the old one. Okay, just because I'm mean, I'm going to sleep only 100 milliseconds. Okay, so you can see the numbers are going uh, much faster. Let's roll back to version one. So I'm going to roll back to version one and hopefully we will be able to see those errors. Let's see, we should be waiting. Right now it should be faster because my image should be cached. And no, no mistakes. Yeah, my bad, just because I was saying. But trust me, you are supposed to see errors because while my Spring Boot application was still starting, it wasn't ready to receive those requests. And probably, oh, I know if, what, what is happening. Um, uh, in the latest OpenShift versions, they provided some uh, very nice uh, load balancer. And it's super hard for me to show. I should be trying this running uh, with uh, Minikube, but I forgot to try that. Let me try to see even faster. OpenShift is so efficient that sometimes it's even hard for you to force errors, even though I know it should be, should have some errors. Okay, let's try, or else we will move forward. I'll change it to version two right now, and let's see, let's see. And drum roll, yeah, no mistakes, uh, yeah. Sorry, but if you were using a vanilla Kubernetes and not OpenShift, you would be seeing a lot of errors because the application wasn't ready to service requests. Okay, but so let's try to switch here. I'm going to watch the pods. Okay. As you've seen that my Spring Boot application took some time to boot up. And what happens if I change my, instead of running a Spring Boot application, what happens if I change to a more modern Java version, Java application framework? So I'm going to switch to a Quarkus application, which is going to do the same. And in case of Quarkus, it should be super fast to create this container and to get this thing running. So right now it's downloading uh, the image from my key.io repository. And it's going to be super fast. Yes, it's already running. So it should take like, uh, um, it should be much faster than my Spring Boot application. But my demo failed because I wanted to see some errors and unfortunately I didn't. So you have to trust my word, but I bet you that if you go to the tutorial and try to run, some of the examples that we have here, running any Kubernetes distribution that is not OpenShift, you will have a lot of errors, okay? So you have to trust me uh, at least on this one. So let's go back here to building images. So what are the ways that we have to build images? So, uh, so first, uh, Kubernetes is going to run container images. And this container images must be available somewhere. Uh, you could be using Docker Hub, even though uh, a lot of people are trying to avoid Docker Hub these days after they update their policies uh, because they're going to expire container images after six months or some or so. So some good alternatives, uh, public alternatives and free ones that you can deploy your public containers are key.io uh, or quay.io, the one that I'm using right now. Oh, by the way, quay.io or key.io, depends if you're British or American or how you pronounce it. And I've learned it that, it, that you have to pronounce it key because my hotel, when I went to Australia the first time, my hotel was, uh, the address was like, I don't know, 1010 Circular Quay. And I've tried to take, to, to, I asked the taxi driver to take me to the hotel and he said, there's no such place as Circular Quay. 
Okay, well, sorry. Uh, my bad. Then I took my mobile phone and showed him the address. Oh, you meant circular key. Oh, well, yeah, well, uh, for me, it's written Quay, but if you say it's, uh, I hope it's the same hotel. Yeah, but yeah, yes, that's what happens when you have this different pronunciation between countries. So if you ask a British person or an Australian person, they'll say key.io. Other public container that you can find is GCR, the Google Container Registry. Uh, we can also have the Red Hat private registry. And if you're running Kubernetes, uh, OpenShift, OpenShift also provides you an internal private registry. So you don't want your internal application being published on a public container registry. Don't worry. A lot of the Kubernetes distributions provide you with an internal container registry and OpenShift does the same for you. I think OpenShift was the first one to, to provide this goodie for you. So the traditional workflow to create a container image to publish that, you would craft a Docker file, you would build your own image using a Docker build, uh, you would do a Docker push to the remote host, and then later you would create a YAML file and apply that to your particular application. Okay, so the steps that I'm going to perform right now are in the tutorial, of course, with the link that I shared with you, and I'm going to just follow the structures that are available here on building images, okay? So, uh, and luckily, if you followed here the tutorial, you can see that on the yellow boxes or orange boxes, yellowish boxes, on the right side, you have this very nice icon which in which you click, will provide you copy it. Yeah, it took me one week to be able to create this JavaScript, so I hope you enjoy it. I will copy the, uh, the instructions directly to your clipboard, and I find it super useful when running this particular tutorial, okay? So that's what we're going to try to run right now. So my demo was working. And uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. If, uh, okay. I'm the right project. Let me uh, kubectl uh, delete, deploy my boot. So I'm, go I'm going to start clean. kubectl delete service my boot. Just to make sure I don't have any errors because uh, my project wasn't clean. And while we're doing that, kubectl delete root my boot. Okay. And sometimes the delete command uh, hangs because Kubernetes needs to do some housekeeping to clean up uh, all of the in different hosts and different everything else. So uh, you should never try to force that or try to delete namespace. I used to delete namespace forcefully, trying to speed up this process, but I talked to one of the Red Hat Kubernetes engineers and they told me never do that, okay? Because you might get your uh, Kubernetes cluster into an unstable state. And of course, we don't want to do that. So delete your resources and never delete your namespace or never force any deletion because you likely will have an uh, unstable state, okay? So let me copy here. So I have a Spring Boot Java application. I'm going to change that particular folder. I'm going to run MVN clean package. And I'm going to run it, Java dash jar. You can see, uh, just to see if my Java application is working. Yes, it's working. Okay, it took me almost four seconds to do that. And curl local host, 80. Yes, it's replying Jumbo. Okay, that's the application that I have right now. And what else do we have here? Also, you will note that in this particular folder, I already have a Docker file. So if you want to create a container, you need a Docker file, unless you're using another tool like JIB provided by Google or S2I, for example, provided by Red Hat. So the most basic way for you to create a container is through a Docker file. So you need to provide some instructions like the base image, some uh, the, the port that your application is running and the command that you need to run to run your particular application. In our case, it's going to be java-jar and the name of the jar of our application. And once we have this Docker file, oh, sorry. Hey, sorry to interrupt. Uh, there's a question here uh, from mm -hmm. Sanjay. Um, uh, it's asking uh, what is the order of deleting the deployment service and route or um, route service and deploy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, 
Since I'm deleting everything, usually there is not a particular order in which you, you should be deploying. I'm just clean, cleaning up resources. Uh, but uh, again, the root is the thing that exposes your application to the public. The SVC is uh, the service is the thing that allows you to find your application inside your Kubernetes cluster. And the deployment is your application by itself. So uh, if you delete the deployment and the root is still up, it means that people might be trying to reach your application, but your application is not there anymore. So I can see that C Diapa here uh, replied, root serves and deploy. It sounds me to uh, like a reasonable order, even though uh, uh, regarding the final state of this like cleanup, it doesn't matter which order you, you choose. Okay, but again, root service and deploy sounds very reasonable to me. Yeah, um, can I uh, add one thing here? Uh, so basically in the past, in my experience, what we have done was we annotate, uh, we add an annotation for each of these resources like deployment service and routes and pods, I guess. Literally every single thing that you create as a resource on Kubernetes, you add an annotation uh, application label, right? It says label app is equal to my app or my Spring Boot app, something like that. So if you annotate like that for every single resource, then you can use one command to delete every single thing cleanly. Saying OC delete uh, minus L uh, app is equal to my app. So it goes and matches every single resource that has that label in it, and then it dis deletes everything. That's what I have done in the previous experience. Oh, perfect, Leah. you're absolutely right. If I had created these resources properly, like using a YAML file and assigning proper labels to these resources, I could have deleted everything like kubectl delete all and dash l app equals to my boot. And I don't know if I need a dash all to, and uh, I should be good. But since I didn't have any labels, that's why I emphasize it. You should be using labels to organize your resources because then you can apply these super nice commands, okay? Or super rare, if you want to delete all resources in your namespace, you can also do this, delete all, that's dash all, even though I don't recommend you to do so because again, you might have other stuff running, but if it's just a demo, just like what I'm doing, you could, uh, uh, be doing that. Okay, no resources found because we already deleted everything. Okay, but thanks for the information, Subash. It was very helpful. No problem. And uh, so coming back here, we have the Docker file. How do I build a container image using a Docker file? So I'm going to type here Docker build uh, tag, which means I want to give a name to my container image or else. Uh, it's going to create a random name and I don't want that. So it's going to be key.io is not the name of the, the, the URL of the repository that I want to. If it's a private repository, you would have like an internal uh, DNS name or even an IP address. So my repo is the name of the group or the organization in which you want to uh, store your container image. And my app is the name of the application and uh, column. And V1 is the version of the application that I'm creating. And now the next parameter is where can I find the Docker file? Since the Docker file is in my current folder, I just going to give a dot, which means, well, it's in the folder where we are right now. So let's try to build this particular image. And you will see it was super fast because I had everything already cached and my image was already created and was tagged key.io slash my repo, my app ver uh, v1. And how do I run this particular container? So now that I have my container image already running, for me, the way for me to run it is to type these magic words, docker run, uh, I'm going to type dash, uh, dash rm, meaning that after the container is finalized, like after it's killed or if, after it terminates, I want the container to be removed uh, or else you have a lot of trash uh, left before. Dash IT because I want the terminal to, uh, to be stuck in the container execution or else it's going to run in the background. I want to map port 8080 from my machine to my container or the opposite, I don't remember. Uh, I'm going to give a name to my container uh, or else it's going to create a random name. And now I give the name of the image, which is the one that we just created. Okay, and we run it. 
So now I'm running the same Java application that we ran before, but it's running inside a container. And I'm forwarding port 8080 from my machine to the port 8080 running inside the container. So if I curl port 8080 again, yes, it's running as before. Beautiful, isn't it? Yes, I think one of the nicest ways for us to ensure that we have uh, the same environment, the same application running consistently in multiple different uh, like hosts. It doesn't matter if it's my notebook or the test machine or the CI CD pipeline or the production machine is by using containers. And actually that's the main reason for us to be using containers these days. Okay, so we ran and my particular container has a special endpoint. So if I go to curl localhost 88 sys resources, it's going to show that, well, I have 1.8 um, uh, gig or uh, yeah, or uh, 1700 uh, megabytes of RAM and eight cores available to be running my application. Okay. And I have another endpoint that is trying to consume the entire memory of my, that is available to my container. So what happens when I run this particular one? Yes, allocated 80% of the maximum uh, memory available and it's still returning. Okay, well, why, why is that? Because very likely that's the only container that is running in my, on my virtual machine. Okay, so, but let's try to do something else. Let's try to run our container in a constrained, uh, with constrained resources. So I don't want to give the entire virtual machine to my particular container. I want to say to my container, well, you can use at most 400 megabytes of RAM and at most one core, uh, one CPU. So I'm going to, and remember, I'm just following the instructions here in the tutorial, and I'm going to, just to speed up the things, I'm going to copy and paste it. Oops, I forgot to stop this one. Let's start over here. So I'm going to run the same application, but now I'm constraining the resources just by applying 400 megabytes of RAM and one CPU. Okay. Let's curl the endpoint again. Yeah, you can see that my application is still starting up because I gave only one core for my application to run. So before it took only about four seconds to start. This time it took more than 50, 15 seconds for my application to start because you have a constrained environment. So what happens when I call now? Oops. The Sys resources endpoint is still showing up. 1.8 gigs and eight cores. So if I try to consume uh, the amount of memory that is available, very likely my application is going to be killed uh, because uh, it won't have enough memory. And it's taking forever right now because it's super slow. Actually it's taking more than I was expecting because it should have crashed already because remember, I only gave 400 megabytes and this particular one is trying to consume the whole 1.8 gigabytes of memory. It will crash eventually. Okay, so let me stop here because uh, or else it's going to take forever. So slow that I can't even kill it. Okay, and when it happens, there is a way for us to do, I can get the name of the particular application Oh, now it was killed, okay. Okay, it was super slow. Uh, yes, nothing running anymore, but eventually it got killed. So how can I fix that? Well, depending on the Java version that you're running, uh, the Java virtual machine will have, the, will have container ergonomics. So one way for you to fix it, if you go here, I have another Docker file. Uh, memory and right in, uh, in this particular container image, I'm using a Java version that is uh, 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 Java 8 update 151. Any version after uh, Java 8 update 151, we will have the container ergonomics built in into the JVM. So the only fix that I need to do is to update and uh, give this particular parameters to my Java virtual machine. Unlock experimental VM options, use C group memory limit, and uh, that's it. 
If I do that, my, con my uh, Java virtual machine will only show the amount of memory that is available to my particular container, okay? And that's all that we need to do to fix that. And although it really depends on the kind of environment that you're using, if you're using Java, this is way the way for, proper way for you to create containerized Java applications that are container friendly. Other frameworks, other tools, we have, their, we have other kinds of restrictions. So if you use these parameters of the JVM in a recent JVM, and remember Java 8 like is ancient, you should be using a newer Java version these days. But if you still have, you still have a legacy one, just make sure to update your Java 8 to something uh, above 151 and to use these parameters when running Java inside containers, okay? So this is the very first tip of the day. And let's move forward because we still have a lot of things to show and I don't want you to miss anything. So building exercises, next steps, resource limits. So how can I uh, request and also limit the amount of resources that my container is running, uh, is using inside my Kubernetes cluster? So you can see you just add this particular information to the Kubernetes YAML file that you're using to deploy your application. So you can see you will be adding a resources a section and within resources you have a request and limits and you have memory and CPU on both sections you have like requests and limits so what's the difference between requests and limits so requests uh, works this way request you're telling your Kubernetes cluster I'm requesting this particular amount of memory and this particular amount of CPU which are the minimum requirements that my application needs to be run successfully. So Kubernetes will use this particular information to decide, oh, uh, so this application requires at least 300 megabytes of RAM. So Kubernetes is going to look inside all of the nodes or all of the hosts in your cluster to see which one has at least 300 megabytes of RAM available. So if Kubernetes has one of the nodes and that particular node only has 100 megabytes of memory available, Kubernetes definitely won't uh, schedule the container to be executed on that particular node, okay? So requests are the minimum amount of memory and these numbers are used by Kubernetes to decide where your application is going to be executed inside the cluster. What about limits? Once your application is already running on the host, you can also provide some limits saying that at most, this application can consume 400 megabytes of RAM. And in this case of the CPU is going to consume at most a thousand millicores, which is the equivalent of one single core. Okay. So requests and limits provides the minimum amount of information and the maximum amount of information that your application can consume inside your Kubernetes cluster. Okay. And uh, uh, the hidden truth of containers that Kubernetes is, and containers uh, in general, like running Docker, it's a shared environment. You want to consolidate resources. You want to be able to pack the, like, the greatest amount of applications that you can run in the same amount of hardware resources. So it's all about sharing CPU, sharing memory, sharing uh, uh, disk, sharing uh, network. So, and we, for you to be able to be a good citizen, a good Kubernetes citizen, you should be specifying the sections like resource requests and resource limits inside your Kubernetes YAML file, okay? So what is the exercise now? I'm going to switch back here to the browser, resources and limits, okay? And I'm going to run, so um, still in the, uh, the same, so I'm going to make sure that I don't have any kubectl get all. And, uh, make sure that I don't have any resources. And I can tell that my cluster or my internet, just because I'm doing this Zoom thing today, it's extremely slow. It should be much faster. So what are we going to do right now? I don't have anything deployed. I'm going to deploy this particular Spring Boot application. And this Spring Boot application, if you look at this file, you see that I 
specify here the container, the image, but it didn't provide any kind of limit or any kind of request, any kind of limit. Okay. And let's try to run here. kubectl describe, and if I go here through, you'll be able to see that I don't have any resource limits defined uh, either. Yeah, it's just a plain old resource definition from Kubernetes. Okay, good. So delete this one now. And now we're going to see a different YAML, which is going to specify the resources for my particular application. So let's try to edit this particular file. Or C, and what is different? Yes, you can see that now this one is saying, well, resources requests, this application is requesting 300 megabytes of RAM and is requesting 10,000 millicores, which equals to 10 cores, which I don't think I have in my cluster. I don't have any node with 10 cores available. So let's see what happened when I try to execute this application in my Kubernetes cluster. Okay. If I execute now a kubectl get pods, yeah, it's not running. It's still pending because uh, Kubernetes is saying, well, you ask it for 10 cores. I don't have any nodes in my cluster with 10 cores. I won't be able to run your particular, uh, this particular deployment. So that's what happens. Your pods, even though it's, uh, you asked Kubernetes to create that because you created the deployment, your pod will be stuck forever in the pending state because that's a way for Kubernetes to tell, well, I don't have enough resources available, okay? And what's happening? Let me try to hear. So I, I typed the command to show the Kubernetes events that are happening in my cluster. And it's, it's telling me, warning, fail scheduling, because this particular pod that is running inside my cluster, I have three nodes in my cluster, and zero are available because I don't have enough CPU. You have insufficient CPU, okay? So that's how it works when you ask too much of your cluster. Uh, you should be lowering the request uh, in your application or you need to be increasing the machines inside your cluster, okay? So one of the, um, Edson, uh, one of the debates that we always uh, run into um, in our organization uh, we, we use OpenShift uh, in our organization, uh, is that, you know, um, there is only a certain amount of uh, CPU and memory available uh, as far as the cluster is concerned. But there are just so many applications that are, uh, that are requesting for it. So everybody starts defining their request limit. Let's say they say, I want uh, a minimum of uh, 0.5 core and a minimum of uh, one gigabyte. Right, so at some point it will run out of uh, the the space. So uh, then uh, we run into a debate of, hey, uh, we after the application starts, it really doesn't require that much of uh, you know half a core or you know uh, it doesn't really require one GB. It just uses it only during the application startup. That is the reason why we define that as a minimum. So. Uh, as an application, while running, it doesn't use that. So let's just give a minimum of only 10 millicores as a request and just 256 MB as a request. Because we already, we can set the uh, limit high, uh, you know, so that it can actually take it from the cluster when it is needed after it starts up. The only problem comes when every application in the cluster tries to start at the same time. That is the only time when it fails. Right? Is, it, is this the recommended way though? Uh, or do you have any um, pointers or uh, links or technical write-ups from Red Hat uh, that you can share uh, uh, about resource usages? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know if I have any material uh, uh, regarding this, but I can see that it's a common thing because when developers like are, are unchecked, just they're deploying, they're creating their own YAML files to be deploying. Well, how much do mm -hmm. I need to ask? Oh, just ask like for, five cores and you should be more than enough. Yeah, even though, of course, your application won't be consuming all, all that uh, stuff. But I truly believe that to be successful in this kind of, in this creating this YAML file, it's something that you need to discuss 
with the ops team because they know they have the spreadsheets saying, well, what kind of applications are running, how much memory, how much CPU each one of them is consuming. So it can have a proper provisioning and they can account, well, I have these resources, let's give this. Well, your application is not consuming because they're monitoring the statistics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, your application is not using all of these. We can reduce the consumption on this one and the other one. And if you really hit uh, hard limits, then you need to add more nodes to your yeah. to your cluster but again this is not a thing that a developer should be worried oh you need to add more nodes to my cluster because this capacity uh, planning is something typical of the ops team but you need to be part of the discussion so sure. i strongly yeah. encourage people to be talking to their ops peers to be to have a truly devops environment but yeah we uh, one of more the than that, that i don't have are... anything uh, one of the things that uh, our ops team is considering is enforcing some standards uh, by setting some limits using open policy agent where you know if some application tries to you know deploy with extremely high uh, requests then it will stop it um, is there any other ways to prevent that like as far as governance is concerned for the uh, ops team yeah, not that I'm aware of. But if you're a Java developer, I can tell you that if you use Quarkus, for example, you can mm -hmm. at least reduce the amount of the, the memory oh, consumption yeah. by at least half. Absolutely. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, Quarkus is awesome. I have tried that and the time it takes to start is just amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and now we have some public references. So we have like customers like Lufthansa uh, and uh, Vodafone that switched their Spring Boot workloads uh, to Quarkus. And they're super happy because with uh, Vodafone, their uh, AWS bill was cut by half because they're using half the amount of memory. And for Lufthansa, their, their, their bill was cut by three because Quarkus is using three times less memory than Spring Boot in their, in their deployments. So yeah. that's another way for you to consolidate even more resources if that's an option for you. Yeah, absolutely. We are considering it already. Okay. Oh, and I don't know if I mentioned, uh, if you just choose to use, if you already have OpenShift, uh, now Quarkus is supported on top of OpenShift for free. So if you have an yeah, OpenShift yeah. installation, you can use Quarkus mm -hmm. for free. So sure. Yep. Best of everything. Yep. Yep. Okay. And uh, let's see, where was I? Think did I delete the deployment? I don't know. Let's try to delete it. Yes. Uh, so let's now let's try to create a new deployment with more like sane limits. So I'm copy and pasting here and I'm running. So I'm going to cat this file. And now I'm just requesting uh, 300 megabytes of RAM and a quarter of a core. And the limit is going to be 400 megabytes and one core, the upper limit. So, and describe here, uh, we should have this limit. Yes, if you describe the pod, you can see the limits specified here in the description. And I can deploy my service. Host it. QCTL get service. I mean, you're going to create a route just to be faster. Okay. Curl. Oops. QCTL get root. I can curl this particular endpoint. Okay. Yes. And what can we do right now? Consume. Okay. So why did it reply a bad gateway? Because I tried to, I asked my Java application to consume all of the resources, but since it was an old Java version, it consumed everything and it was killed. But because Kubernetes already restarted my pod, I can do this. Watch. QCTL get pods. Yeah, my commands are super slow today. So it's running. Let's do the same. Consume. And 
Yeah, bad, bad, bad. And uh, yeah, you can see the message here on the top. It was out of memory killed because it was consuming too much memory. And Kubernetes detected that. And very soon, yes, Kubernetes restarted, created another pod, and now this one is running. Okay? So that's what happens when you have a bad citizen and or your application tries to consume the entire memory uh, in the, uh, above the upper limit that you specified. So it's running. It's working as expected. Okay. So moving forward, rolling updates. This is a super nice uh, Kubernetes feature because it's amazing that in 2021, we, feel, uh, we can have rolling updates for free when we use an environment like Kubernetes. I don't know how many of you uh, tried to set up to uh, use it blue-green deployments before or tried to set up a blue-green deployment pipeline in the past. So I know that I've been doing these blue-green deployments for quite some time. And I remember when we had to create, we had like two separate servers or two separate VMs. They would be the blue-green deployments. You would need the load balancer. And we would have to create like a thousand scripts just to be able to perform this kind of blue-green deployment. And with Kubernetes, we have an enhanced version of a blue-green deployment. We have a rolling update in our, in our Kubernetes cluster for free because that's the native way of Kubernetes to perform an, up, an upgrade of your particular deployment. So how does it work? So again, I'm going to go back here to my particular deployment. I think I already have the right deployments, but if not, let me try up, apply the commands again. Okay. Oops. Watch the pods. Yes, I have it running, so it didn't change. That's what, that's what I was expecting. So, and, okay, let's run a curl. So kubectl, get root, while true, curl, sleep, dot five, done. I forgot a do. Okay, so it's curling my endpoint. And I think for this particular demo, I'm going to split my window one more time. And I'm just setting my cube config because I have a lot of different cluster that I can access. I just want to make sure that I'm connected to the right one. So see, I have one pod running and my curl is running here in the bottom and I'm going to type a command. I'm going to kubectl edit, deploy my boot. And now I want to change the number of replicas. You see, I only have one replica running. I'm going to update it, oops. Replicas one, I'm going to update it to two. So as soon as I save the file, you see on the top, Kubernetes is going to create another pod for me. And you should be able to see uh, the new one showing up here because it's going to show one, two, three. Yeah, it's taking some time, but eventually it will show up here. Oh gosh, today is super slow. Just because you're watching. Yes, now it's showing one, two, three, and so I have two different pods running. So keep this one, this curl running. Yeah, you can see. So let's try to update now the version of my application. I'm going to edit the deployment to edit the de deployment again. And now instead of my boot v1 i'm going to show my boot v2 so let's upgrade the image and save it so what is happening kubernetes is performing a rolling update so how does a rolling update perform so i asked kubernetes to have like two instances running it into any given moment of time 
So whenever I have that, Kubernetes is going to guarantee at least two instances running. So whenever I have a rolling update and I change the version, for example, of the application, Kubernetes for the rolling update, Kubernetes is going to create a new pod of the new version. And once this application is up and running, okay, Kubernetes know, okay, I have one, this new version is running okay, I can kill one of the other versions, so now I have two. And now that I have two, Kubernetes is going to create another pod of this new version. And once this other pod is running successfully, Kubernetes is going to kill the old version. And just in case one of the new pods is not successful, for example, oh, I have a new version of my application, but this one is failing, it's not working properly, Kubernetes will not uh, 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 delete the old pods. So if you, Kubernetes creates a new deployment with uh, the new version and this one is failing, yeah, Kubernetes will like hang the rolling update. Uh, this one uh, uh, will, keep, it will still be pending and the other ones will be successful because we'll still be running. So you don't have any downtime in running your workloads into production, okay? So this is how a rolling update performs. And usually it's much nicer when I have more, uh, more than two. Let's see if we can do that. Edit, deploy my boots. So I'm going to replicas. I'm going to get three. Also, I have this watch here. I'm going to do that every second. So I think it's... So I'm going to choose three replicas, and now I want to use uh, not Spring Boot, but the Quarkus version one. Save the deployment and see what happens in the top and in the bottom. So have two containers being created. Yeah, one is running, that's why Kubernetes is already deleting another one. I have another container being created, but three instances running. Kubernetes is creating another one. One is already running, so that's why it's terminating. One of the old ones. And once the last container creating is running, Kubernetes is going to delete the, the one from the previous version. And yes, it's already deleted, okay? So now you can see that now all of the containers are running the Quarkus version, which is returning supersonic subatomic Java, instead of saying bonjour or aloha, which was the Spring Boot version. Okay, that's how you know that the rolling update is being performed uh, nicely. And last time, I go to image, uh, and I'm going to change again, my boot v2, save the file. And if you check on the top and the bottom, you will be able to see the rolling update being executed. Okay, oops. Now you can see the errors, okay? Aha, uh -huh. uh -huh. now uh, I couldn't see in the beginning. You see my curl was stuck. I wasn't receiving any requests, and why is that? Because Kubernetes updated all the application versions to Spring Boot, but because my Spring Boot application was still loading, it wasn't replying to my request, and I even saw some errors. So it got stuck for, uh, for quite some time, and then I had some errors because my Spring Boot wasn't, wasn't ready yet. So this is a very common problem in the Java world because Java applications usually take a long time to be ready, but luckily, uh, thanks to the Kubernetes features, we can solve this problem if we're using a legacy Java application. And how do we do that? We can achieve that through liveness and readiness probes. Okay, hey, so let's try hey, to add this stuff. Hey, Edson, there's a, there's a question uh, in the chat. Is there a way to specify to bring up additional containers when we get more load or existing containers resource limits are used? Uh, yes, uh, there are some auto scaling uh, features of Kubernetes uh, and you can see uh, there are different ways for you to scale your application. For example, one of them is to scale your cluster. Suppose that you're running your Kubernetes and OpenShift cluster in, in, inside a cloud computing environment like AWS, Google or Amazon or IBM Cloud or anywhere. And you can see, you can ask your Kubernetes cluster, 
if, uh, uh, if the load of resources like CPU or memory uh, reaches uh, the threshold of 80% of resource consumption, you can use your Kubernetes, at least I know it's an OpenShift feature. Uh, you can configure uh, Kubernetes in OpenShift to uh, request new nodes from the cloud computing provider. So if your cluster currently has four nodes and uh, resource usage reaches 80%, you can, uh, the Kubernetes cluster is going to create another uh, node. And if you had four, now it's going to add another one. So you're going to have five nodes in your cluster. That's one way to scale your cluster. Another way is to scale your application. So not changing the nodes in your cluster. You can scale your application uh, uh, up and down very easily if you add a technology, for example, called Knative. Knative use, uh, works super well. Uh, for scaling up and scaling down your applications and you can even scale to zero for example like uh, using serverless and actually i even have another talk talking about knative serverless and scaling up and scaling down we can schedule it later if you can find some time for me and if you want me back of course that's another question okay but yes knative is a project that you can uh, it's an operator it's going to be some resources that you can add to your Kubernetes cluster, and then you have like beautiful scale up and scale down uh, capabilities. And I say beautiful because uh, it's going to be super fast. Uh, so if you add Knative to your Kubernetes cluster, you will be able to scale up and down your applications in a super fast way. All right, I, I hope I answered the question. So let's move to the liveness and readiness pro because we are here for one hour already and I still have two topics to cover. So right now I need to delete everything. So I can kubectl delete, delete all. And while I'm deleting, you'll be able to see my pods being terminated in the top and now my curve in the bottom will start to fail. Yes, I'm stopping it. Yeah, pods terminating already. Hey, uh, while that is terminating, Edson, um, can you talk a little bit about horizontal pod auto scaling and vertical pod auto scaling, and what is the difference between those two? Uh, horizontal and vertical scaling. Yeah, so there is a feature that I, uh, I think uh, we came across uh, called vertical pod auto scaling, where um, Kubernetes automatically learns the amount of resources the application needs and automatically applies the resource limits to it. I don't know if, I mean, uh, I don't think it is supported yet, probably. It may be some documentation that. Uh, one of our associates in our organization has found. Okay, uh, no, now that you ask it, that's uh, new for me. I know the horizontal one, which is a traditional scaling that you can mm -hmm. achieve, but vertical, uh, it's something new. Well, so <laughs> I don't have an answer. Actually. Oh, sorry? Yeah, I think that's, that's still in uh, technology preview. And uh, Officially, in a, with the open subscription technology preview, but it's it's there from a long time. But, um, looks like not that much familiar, right? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, not stable yet, yeah. but just because you mentioned, uh, I'll take a look. Now I'm interested, and maybe we can add that to the to, to the tutorial too, to the material that we have available. So yes, let's take a look. Okay, but thank okay. you for pointing out. I, I don't know anything about this feature yet, but just because you mentioned, I'm going to look after it. Uh, we have just one more question. Uh, Sanjay, uh, do you mean to ask what is Knative? Oh, okay. Yeah, Knative is a project um, which was created by Google, and now you have like multiple different companies um, contributing to it. Red, Red Hat is one of them. Uh, Key Native is a project that allows you to uh, add, uh, uh, how can I say? The first goal of the project was to add serverless capabilities to a Kubernetes cluster. 
But serverless, what is serverless? Serverless is something that allows you to scale to zero. So if, if you don't have any requests coming, no resources being consumed. But as soon as you receive a request, Knative will uh, quickly create a Kubernetes pod to serve that request that is coming. And just as fast as Kubernetes, uh, that Knative can scale from zero to one, if you receive like a lot of requests at the same time, you can say, oh, whenever I reach a certain threshold, I want to create another pod, yeah? Knative can do that. So with Knative, if you don't have any requests, you can scale down to zero. But if you receive a million requests, Knative can scale very easily to, for example, 20 pods to be able to service those, those requests. So Knative is uh, a technology that allows you to do that and allows you to do much more, but I'm just focusing on the, the serving part, which is the one that scales up and scales down because Knative also has an eventing part, which allows you to create cloud native events uh, and, uh, and send them between applications. And uh, now it, the project's called Tecton, but if you want to uh, create, uh, uh, build your applications, if you want to have deployment pipelines in your Kubernetes cluster, and you're not building applications all the time, so you don't want to consume cluster resources when your, when your continuous integration server is not running anything. And a very common problem is that the most con uh, used uh, continuous integration server worldwide is Jenkins. And Jenkins is a traditional Java application. So it's not unusual for you to have a Jenkins server consuming like eight gigabytes of RAM uh, in your cluster. And usually you need a Jenkins server per team. So you can easily see how easily you can spend like gigabytes or even terabytes of memory just by running Jenkins servers. So Tecton uh, started as a key native project that allows you to uh, have a serverless uh, continuous integration server. Because if you don't have any pipe running, you're not consuming any resource. But as soon as anybody, for example, uh, pushes a commit to your Git repo, this is going to trigger uh, a pipeline build, then Kubernetes, uh, Technon Kubernetes will create a pod to build uh, your application. And once this pod is gone, known resources are being consumed. So Knative is, is a big project, but I think the nicest feature is that it can scale to zero and scale up if you install Knative inside your uh, OpenShift cluster. Okay, but I can share some resources. If you want to learn more about Knative, I can share here. Uh, another link, dn.dev slash knative tutorial. So okay. um, knative is just like an operator. Is that correct? Uh, is it just an operator, uh, Edson, or is it something like a separate install on top of the OpenShift cluster? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, for I can t um, I don't remember for vanilla Kubernetes, but can I can tell you that if you have an OpenShift cluster, knative is an operator. It's called okay. uh, it's called OpenShift Serverless Operator, which is built on top of uh, Knative. So okay. for OpenShift, it is an operator. Another uh, question I had uh, from your previous uh, comment was, uh, you said about Tecton pipeline, right, uh, for CI/CD. Is that completely supported right now by Red Hat on OpenShift? Uh, yes, it is. If you're running OpenShift after 4.5 or 4.5 uh, uh -huh. or later, you have uh, Tecton support already. It's uh, okay, great. and I think it's stable. Yeah. Okay, cool. Awesome. Thank you. So, yeah. So, Tecton is the open source project and uh, the OpenShift feature is called OpenShift Pipelines. So the last time I think it was not supported, I didn't know that 4.5 started supporting uh, Tecton in production. Cool. Yeah, uh, I know it's there, but uh, yes, yeah, support status, I'm not sure. It's much easier if you ask this question to uh, somebody from the sales team or for yeah, the account sure. team, because <laughs> uh, I'm from the developer experience team. So people ask me, oh, uh, is it this feature is support or not? I know how to use it. I know how it works. 
and because I'm a developer and I want to use that stuff, but I would like support levels, then it's not my, uh, it's not on my side of the house. And I think it's a uh, bad, but uh, yeah, that's how it works at least uh, uh, for now. Well, thanks for sharing that uh, info with us, though. Uh, we appreciate that. Welcome. And uh, let's see where we were. Yes, we're talking about liveness and redness probe. So. Uh, so what is a liveness probe and what is a redness probe? A liveness probe is a check that you have in your application to tell you if your application is live because sometimes your application reaches an inconsistent state, like your application is running, but it's only returning errors. Or your application is running, but it's reached an out of memory, or it's you have some dirty state inside your application, and it's taking forever for your application to reply to any requests. So what is a liveness probe? Liveness probe, and there are multiple different ways for you to configure that, but probably the easiest way for you to create a liveness probe is for you to create an endpoint in your application, and Kubernetes is going to check that particular endpoint uh, in a certain amount of time. You can specify it's configurable. So you can tell Kubernetes, check this particular endpoint every 30 seconds. And this endpoint must return a 200 OK uh, within one second. If it takes more than one second, it means that something is wrong with my application. So a liveness probe is an endpoint that you can configure in your application and with Kubernetes to tell Kubernetes, Kubernetes, if you check the liveness probe in my application and that, the, the liveness probe doesn't check, you can kill my application. Okay, so that's how Kubernetes checks if your application is live. So one of the, this is a very nice feature. If your application is performing badly or behaving badly, Kubernetes checks the liveness probe, and if it's not well, Kubernetes kills that. And because Kubernetes always guarantee a certain number, number of instances running into production, Kubernetes will automatically create another pod, and hopefully your application will be behaving well with the new instances, okay? That's what a liveness probe is for. And readiness probe, what is a readiness probe? Well, again, if you're using a, a traditional Java framework that takes a lot of time to start up, like if you're using a Spring Boot application or an application server like JBoss, they take some time to start up and warm up. So, and while your application is starting up and warming up, you shouldn't be forwarding your production request to this application that is not warm yet because uh, you have two different options. Either you will receive an error or because it's not warm it up yet, your application will be able to connect, but it's going to take forever. It's going to take like 30 seconds to be able to reply to the request. So your application is live. Yeah, it's behaving well, but it's not warm. Your application is not ready to receive production requests. That's why you can create another endpoint in your application and in Kubernetes to be the readiness probe. So you can tell Kubernetes, well, Kubernetes, check this particular readiness endpoint. And if it doesn't reply in one second, it means that it's not warm yet and you shouldn't be forwarding production requests. But once the application uh, is replying in, this, in, the, in the specified amount of time, it means that it's ready and you can forward production requests to your particular endpoint. And there's a lot of confusion between liveness and redness probes because Kubernetes uses the same mechanism to check both. Like you send a request and you wait for the request for a 200 OK in a certain amount of time. So in the real world, what is the difference between liveness and readiness probe? The difference is this one. If the, uh, if the bad behavior can be solved by restarting your application, then it's a liveness probe. If the bad behavior can't be solved by restarting your application, then it's a readiness probe. Uh, example, your application connects to a database, okay? And the database is down. Restarting your application multiple times won't solve the problem because the problem is not in your application. Your problem is in the database. So checking database connectivity inside your application uh, a good, is a good candidate for a readiness probe, okay? Because your application will be there. Kubernetes won't forward requests your, to your application because it's not known of the instances already. 
But as soon as your database is up again, the readiness probe will return OK, and Kubernetes will start forwarding requests to your application. OK? So that's the, that's the basic tip that I give to people. When should, is it a liveness probe or a readiness probe? Well, if restarting your application solves the problem, then it's a liveness probe. If not, then it's a readiness probe. And another kind of probe that we had recently, uh, uh, that has recently been added to Kubernetes is this one, the startup probe. Let me see if I have here, yeah. Not in this particular example, readiness probe, liveness probe, and I'm just startup probe. So a startup probe is a special type of probe, which is very similar to the readiness probe, which is only checked when you're starting your application. Okay, so it's checking where well, you just created a pod. It's let me here, startup probe. So. Um, the startup probe is going to wait for one minute, five period, uh, the 12 uh, times five. And uh, if it doesn't return, um, uh, Kubernetes will consider this application to have failed startup. And of course, we'll kill it and create another one. Okay. So it's very similar to the readiness one, but you can specify different parameters for the readiness and the startup probe. Hey, Edson, we have a question uh, in the chat. Uh, Rodit is asking, does liveness check affect the performance of the application? Well, uh, it really depends on how you implement the liveness probe. Okay. If uh, and you as a developer, like uh, regarding Kubernetes, Kubernetes is just sending an HTTP request to the endpoint that you specified. Okay. But if you were performing like a super complex business logic in your liveness probe, then it might affect behavior, okay? I know that I've seen once at least, uh, I saw a team, they would, um, they implemented, not in the liveness probe, but in the readiness probe, they implemented a super complex SQL query to be sent to the database. And the, the, live, the readiness probe was being checked every minute. So you can see a lot of complex queries being sent to the database. It affected uh, overall performance. Yes, so you need to be aware of what kind of computation, what kind of requests are you performing whenever you receive a request to your liveness and readiness probe. But it really depends on you as the application developer. Okay. So I checked the startup probe. So let's go back here to the first example. So you can see here uh, in this YAML file that I have on the screen, uh, we learned that the request resources and limits today. And there are the new section is this one, the liveness probe. I'm using an HTTP get uh, on port 8080 of my application and the path is slash. Initial delay seconds, period seconds and timeout. And the readiness probe, same stuff, HTTP get on the slash health and point, port 80 and you can specif specify the period, so it's going to query the endpoint every three seconds. And for the first time, I'm going to wait, for example, 10 seconds. And here again, uh, I'm going to uh, send a request every five seconds. Maybe this number is too aggressive, but it's just a demo. And the timeout, uh, like I send, I'm going to wait at most two seconds or else I consider the application to be not live. So you can configure all of this stuff inside your application. And if you do that, if you have proper liveness and readiness probe, then you will be able to have like very smooth rolling updates, okay? So for your application to be a good Kubernetes citizen, you should always specify the liveness and readiness probes in your YAML file, and you should be implementing those liveness and readiness probe inside your application. Uh, just in case you, it's a legacy application, you don't have a liveness and readiness probe yet, just point to the root URL of your application just to check if it's performing uh, well enough. So if, because it's better to have uh, like a silly liveness and readiness probe rather than having known. So if you want to be successful using Kubernetes, you should be checking the liveness and readiness probe. And just because in the, we're in the top of the hour, um, uh, I'm not going to run the demos, but you get the point uh, for you to be able to perform this rolling updates and for Kubernetes to be able to restart your application, something is not going well, you should be specifying 
uh, the liveness and readiness probe. And last but not least, we have the config map. If you're still here in this meetup, thank you very much, because I know it's like 7.22 already, and some of us had a full day, so thank you very much for staying uh, until now. What is the config map? A config map, as I mentioned in the beginning, is something that uh, your Kubernetes cluster is an information that your Kubernetes cluster can provide to your application. For example, good candidates are database URLs, database usernames, and passwords, because it depends on the environment. And if you ever read the two-factor applications that was provided from the people from Heroku, it's a good practice for you to do that. You shouldn't be hard coding these values in your application. It should be provided by the environment, either as, as a file that you can read locally or as an environment variable. So what do we have here? We have a, an application that can receive these properties. For example, I have here, uh, I have my uh, database connection is going to receive this one. Uh, I'm going to receive this information through an environment variable called dbcon. I can also have the greeting, the uh, message broker and the love property being provided by environment variables, which is the easiest way for me to consume this application inside uh, this, uh, this configuration inside my application because almost any language and platform provides some easy way for you to get environment variables. Okay. And right now, so I'm going to delete, oh, oh sorry, I'm going to deploy the my boot again, my boot application, my boot service, and I'm going to expose my service as a root. Okay, and watch the pods running. Yes, it's already running. So curl. Huh? Uh, yes, it's running. And if I go to this particular endpoint slash configure, you see that uh, all of the values are the default ones because I didn't provide any value as an environment variable. Okay. So what are some ways for me to provide this environment variable? I can use the kubectl command line to do that. I can do this, for example. I can say kubectl set env deploy slash my boot. And I can say greeting equals to namaste. I updated that. You can see in the top of the screen that because I changed the configuration in my deployment, Kubernetes already is already performing a rolling update and my new version is already running. And now if I curve the same endpoint, you can see that yes, the greeting is already namaste, okay? So, and I can do the same. I could go here and edit. Now I'm going to change the dbcon. And it's going to be JDBC, MySQL, localhost, slash uh, Yanaga. Oops. I did that. I changed the environment. You can see a rolling update in the, in the top being performed already. And yes, it should be running. So if I curl configure, Yes, my database connection is already here. So this is one of the ways that we have to be providing this information to, to, uh, to, my, to my application. And I, I use the CLI, but another way for me to do that is to edit the deployment. If I deploy here, my boot, let's see if I can find it. Spec here, containers. I have environments named greeting value namaste, named dbcon value this one, the image is this one. So I could have provided all of this information in my YAML file uh, too, okay? But it doesn't seem to be like super uh, flexible. Uh, it's very likely that you would want to version these properties. It's very likely that they would be versioned inside the, like for example, a Git repo. So uh, what is a better way for me to be providing these properties to my application? Maybe I should create a properties file. Okay, so I have here, config some properties. So I have this properties file and this property file, some dot properties already have this property greeting and has love. So I'm going to create what we call a config map. So a config map is going to export these environment variables from the properties file that I'm providing for the config map. 
And the way for me to do that is kubectl, create config map, my config from and file, and I can point apps config some properties. Okay, I created the config map. If I say kubectl get config map, it's going to show my config. And if I say my config dash o JSON, yes, you can see that information is here, green and love, right? Green Jumbo and love Amur. Actually, I don't even know which language is that Jumbo. I thought it was a fruit. Okay. So yes, I already have a config map. And how do I make my application use this particular config map that I just created? Well, let's try to apply this particular YAML file here. So yes, I already have a rolling update over there. And while we're waiting for it, let me, let's see how, it's work, how does it work. So my YAML file, now uh, here in the spec from the container, the containers, I'm saying that the, the environment variables for this particular deployment are going to be created from this particular config map ref. So I created a my config, config map, and I'm using it to create the environment variables used by my application. Okay, so everything is running. So if I just curl that particular point slash configure, you should be able to see Here's getting uh, namaste and amour. I well, was supposed to get that. Greeting. Oh, maybe I shouldn't be setting that in the deployment. Okay. Uh, let's see, cat apps, config, but some properties. Jumbo and amour. Uh, Jumbo didn't work, but Amur is working. So I might have made, did, well, I think I did something wrong here. That's why uh, Jumbo is not being shown, as in, I don't even know which language is that, but Amur is working. You can see the love here equals to Amur. So yeah, the demo is the, uh, doesn't let me lie uh, for you, but at least one of the properties is working. I would have to check why it's not working properly. Uh, but otherwise, this demo should work, okay? And that's it. Yeah, I hope you forgive me for this, uh, for, yeah, for the jumbo not working, but at least Namaste is working. Maybe, maybe, let's see. Give CTL. I think the previous assignment that you added might have a perfect today. I think, uh, I, think I, I set it uh, manually. That's why it's not working. If I do greeting dash, set env. So it's performing a rolling update, terminating, yes. Yeah, no luck. Well, sorry. But you can see if it's working properly or not because you have all of the instructions to be performing this tutorial uh, in your computer screen. You can just go to this public URL, dn.dev slash kube-tutorial and follow the instructions by yourself. And if it doesn't work for you, then ping me, create a GitHub issue, or even better than that, send a pull request to fix it. We'll be super happy to accept your pull request. Okay? Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. And I guess that's Thank what you. I had to share with you uh, for today. If you have any questions, uh, I'm available. Or else, one more time, Thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much for staying with me up to 7.31 p.m. I know some of you uh, might be super tired and I really appreciate your effort for staying with us until now. Thank you so much, Edson. This was a great session and we learned a lot from uh, both of the sessions actually, even the last one and this one, very informative. Thank you so much. My pleasure. And uh, just the housekeeping and the raffle time now. Um, if you guys have not registered already, just uh, go ahead and register for the raffle. I'll just give a, a couple of minutes and then I'll, I, uh, I can perform the raffle draw and then find the two winners for tonight.
I'm trying to see how do I unpin myself? I did. I removed the spotlight. So, you know, anybody can. Okay. I'm, uh, hey, Michael, uh, I'm going to share my screen. Um, do you want to go ahead and uh, click the draw button? Yeah. Yep. That's it. All right. So, we um, have how many? We have about 21 participants. Um, the green color ones. So the previous winners from previous sessions. Um, so sorry, these guys won't be able to win again, but yeah. <laughs> For one year though, after one year, they'll again be able to win. All right, I, okay, there's one person who just registered. Okay. I'll just give one more minute and then we'll. Anybody still signing up? If not, I'll go ahead and draw. Yeah, funny. Okay. Yeah, I guess go ahead and uh, draw, uh, Michael. All right, the first one, Maroon. Hey, congratulations, Warren. Nice. Very cool. All right. And then let's the one more two. time. Number two, Dylan. Dylan Lynch. There you go. Dylan, congratulations, Warren and Dylan. We'll be sending you the instructions on how to claim your JetBrains license. Um, mind you that uh, this license will, uh, will have to be redeemed uh, before a certain date. We will send you all the instructions for it. And it is valid for one whole year. It's a free license. Congratulations. All right. I think that should be it uh, for now. Um, is there anything else that anyone wants to share in the group? You're on mute, uh, Michael. Yep, of course, because I'm on the phone versus on the screen. Uh, is there any topics? Are there any topics that the group would like us to pursue in the near future? Uh, so some of the things that we've talked about is um, microprofile, uh, Kotlin, um, service mesh, right? So some of those, those are some of the things uh, that we've thrown out there. But I mean, this isn't this isn't just the two of us. This is the whole group. So yeah, you know, what are some yeah. things that you'd like to see and hear? Yeah, and, and everyone is welcome to uh, send a, uh, a note for us. If you guys are willing to speak in the group and want to present something, just feel free to message to us in the group. Uh, and then we can certainly uh, look into that. If this is just an open group and free for all, uh, basically to learn from one another. All right. Well, if you have ideas or thoughts on it, just reach out to the uh, email or the contacts on the site. Um, and we are more than happy to pursue those things for you. I think uh, Sebastian's has put, yep, there you go. Uh, no, gsojug.org, gso-jug.org. Oh, <laughs> don't send anything to that one. I don't know what that is. Uh, who knows where, what that, where that'll go to. Good catch, thank you. <laughs> Cool. Awesome. All right. Thanks, thanks everybody. Everyone. Really everyone. Awesome. Thanks, Edson. That was fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me.
And everybody, have a great end of the week. Good night. And I hope to see you soon. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good one. Bye. Good night. Bye.